Any questions about election arising from your paper that you've just written? Okay, the question is, why is it not possible for God to choose someone to be saved? Uh, the answer is, it is possible for God to choose someone to be saved. Okay, so the follow-up question is, if God chooses, a, or when God chooses a person to be saved, will he necessarily be saved? Um, okay, so let's, let's back up and go to the first question. Can God, is it possible for God to choose a person to be saved? And I said, yes. But that's just a statement about the nature of God's sovereignty. God is able to do all that is in harmony with his character. He could sovereignly say, you're going to be saved. Now, the next question is, has God ever done that? Do you know any biblical examples that would indicate that God chose a person to be saved apart from their cooperation with him and faith. Okay, the best example is Abraham. And that example gains traction because not about what's said so much as what's not said. <clears throat> okay, we don't really know how God interacted with Abraham and Ur or what was going on in Ur prior to Abraham's movement into Canaan. We do know that Genesis 18, 19 says, I have chosen Abraham so that he may teach his sons to walk in the way of righteousness. so that I may do what? There's an additional clause there in verse 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. And this is one of the texts that is often argued to be an elective text because of the use of the word no. Now, <clears throat> what I see is that Abraham was justified by faith, that uh, there's a consistent pattern of God basing his election on foreknowledge, whether it's 1 Peter 1, 1 to 2, or Romans 8, 28, 29. And it doesn't make sense to me that that foreknowledge is just another way of saying his plan. That God chose people according to his plan to choose them. makes better sense to me in light of God's justice 
that he uh, foreknows what they will do and by virtue of that knows them to be in Christ and in choosing Christ chooses all of them. So I want to rule as uh, unnecessary your second question. That is, since it doesn't appear that God does that, we don't need to ask, what would that mean, since it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, let's just hypothetically say, well, maybe God did actually choose somebody from eternity, let's say it's Abraham, to be saved. Uh, do they have to be saved? Well, I'm going to be a Calvinist okay, when it comes to that and say, look, God's grace is going to create in them desire and power and that grace is going to make them want to and that grace is going to be efficacious in accomplishing his plan. So the question is not do they have to be saved, but how can they not be saved? All right. I mean, God could give everybody efficacious grace and everybody would then be saved. God does not choose to give everybody efficacious grace. Okay. Why? Because apparently he wants something that efficacious grace cannot provide. And that is uh, freely chosen love. Efficacious grace can produce love, but not freely chosen love. Now, it can produce the illusion of freely chosen love. Okay. So, if I build a little robot and put into it a computer program that will create certain emotions and make it feel love for me, and then I initiate that program, that robot will probably think that it's freely loving me. But I know what it doesn't know, that I'm the one who wrote the program. And the reason it loves me is not because it freely chose to, but because I wrote the program so that it would. <laughs> okay. Other questions about uh, election based on your paper writing and research? I just yeah keep keep going. Okay, so we're looking at Ephesians chapter four. We ended with verse twenty-eight, talking about our uh, theology of work and why we work. Verse twenty-nine. Uh, I, my father proposes uh, the age test. that uh, is easy to remember. Let your words be appropriate, gracious, and edifying. I like that. If we add in the truth from verse 25, speak the truth, every man with his neighbor, well, then we can have a gate test. Okay. Gracious, gracious, appropriate, truthful, and edifying. Uh, the King James I think uh, it was, can be improved a little in terms of its translation with that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. <coughs> uh, Greek reads, uh, but if anything is good for the edification of the need, So it's the meeting of a need that's in view in order that it may give grace to the ones who hear. So where does the word appropriate come from? Well, appropriate is our 
working with the word good. Uh, gracious gives grace. Edifying, it meets the need. Okay. The word corrupt in verse 29 is a word that's used for fruit that has gone bad. And uh, that's as I remember. Now it's interesting to me that verse 30 is connected. I, I take it that likely the grieving of the Holy Spirit may be connected to the words that we use. Okay. That is, when we let corrupt communication come out of our mouth, the Spirit of God is grieved. You ought to note Isaiah 63.10, beside verse 30, and that's uh, the Old Testament text that uh, first mentions the concept of the Holy Spirit being grieved and in that context it was Israel's rebellion. King James says, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. The word translated vexed is translated by the Isaiah 63 10. Uh, the words translated vexed is translated by the Septuagint with the same word that occurs here in verse 30, lupita. I do not grieve the Spirit. So certainly rebellion against the Holy Spirit would grieve him. Uh, this verse is a classic text used to demonstrate the personality of the Holy Spirit. Persons are grieved, not forces. Uh, how would we know when the Spirit is grieved? Uh, that's uh, a little more difficult to answer. How can you tell when somebody that you have a relationship has been grieved by your words? Well, we talk about things getting a little chilly. In other words, the warmth of friendliness and relationship diminish, diminishes. And then your ability to perceive that depends on how perceptive you are or not, and uh, uh, the kind of relationship that you had to begin with. I am slow to assume that the Holy Spirit's been grieved rather than quick to assume that the Spirit is grieved. Those who are quick to assume often uh, fall prey to the enemy's harassments and false accusations. Okay. Since the Holy Spirit does not get grieved the way some people do, you touch that clam and it immediately retracts inside of its shell and clamps down and is silent. No, the Holy Spirit is our shepherd. He's the one who convicts of wrong. If you've done wrong, the Spirit's going to convict you. You don't have to be afraid of grieving the Spirit and not knowing it. He's going to deal with you. Sometimes he may use other people to deal with you who will confront you about how your words were hurtful to them. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So I take verse 31 to be a qualification of verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Okay, there's a certain anger that is to be had. 
but there's other wrath and anger that's to be put away. So well, what's the difference between wrath and anger? Well, the standard Greek synonym studies say that wrath in Greek is distinguished as a, a long-standing, uh, over time, uh, kind of anger, whereas the word anger, or gay, typically means the explosive, on-the-spot, boom kind. So when they're used in the same context, that distinction probably holds. When they're not used together, that distinction may or may not hold. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Uh, probably you all learned that verse as a child early on. Uh, children do not appreciate the way in which God has forgiven them. Okay. Hopefully as an adult, your appreciation for the magnitude of your sin requiring the crucifixion of God's Son enhances your appreciation for how much you've been forgiven so that you are then enabled to graciously grant to others forgiveness in the same way God has granted it to you. Any questions about the end of chapter 4? What was the end? Gracious, appropriate, truthful, edifying. about forgiveness. If I have uh, in my thinking grown to understand how much God's forgiven me and I realize that someone has done me wrong and whereas before I learned about God's forgiveness I was not forgiving but now I've changed I'm willing to forgive and I let them know that but they're not willing to um, change their thinking and interaction with me after I've my reality of forgiving them and releasing them from all my right to prosecute in a sense, um, seemingly so. Is it my responsibility to continually um, talk to them and try to help them to change their mind if they show no desire to change their thinking? As much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. So Paul says there's a limit to our ability to live peaceably with all men. That's the goal. Now, there's a difference between live peaceably and live in intimate friendship. You can be at peace with people with whom you have no intimate friendship. So you have to distinguish whether what you're wanting is a certain quality of relationship or you're wanting there to be peace and not uh, conflict. I think many people confuse the two and are dissatisfied when the quality of relationship that they have is not had. Okay. Good question. Any other questions about the end of chapter 4? Alright, chapter 5. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, 
let it not be once named among you as becomes saints. Okay. Any uncleanness. So Paul's applying the Levitical language of uncleanness in a moral sense, which we would expect him to do. And this, I think, together with verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting. The word jesting means coarse jesting, evtrapelia, or double entendre kind of jokes. Okay. Particularly for men, this, uh, you know, it's often called locker room talk. And this uh, passage is what says... It doesn't matter that it's just men. It's not becoming saints. A holy person doesn't laugh about uncleanness. Doesn't laugh about sin. Sin is a laughing matter to the fool, not to the wise person. but uh, rather the giving of thanks so that our conversation is to be characterized by thankfulness. I've written beside verse 4, Matthew 12, 34 to 37, Jesus' key text where he says that we will be judged by our words because out of the heart the mouth speaks. And... Uh, Whatever you say is a reflection of your heart. What's before course jesting? Uh, the, the Greek word is morologia, and uh, the moro part comes from moron, moros, fool. So my inclination would be to read into the word moros, the Old Testament's theology of the fool. Okay, so everything that, particularly Proverbs, would be your greatest contributor to that. What kinds of things are characteristic of fool, and then address that to speech. Okay. Uh, no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay. So. This is one of the short lists, short sin lists. Paul has long sin lists and short sin lists. Uh, the long ones show up in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13 and 6, 9 through 11. 6, 9 to 11, as well as Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Covetousness, I think, in Paul's mind is at the root of almost all sin. This seems to be the point of Romans 7 where he says that the law, that before the law came, I was alive, but when the law came, sin revived, and I died, for it worked all manner of covetousness in me. And covetousness is desiring uh, what, an, what, is, what another has for oneself and that is rooted in selfishness, self-centeredness. So if you uh, find yourself unhappy that others have certain prestige, certain honor, certain position, certain gifts, uh, find yourself inclined to uh, wish that you had it and they didn't or wish that you had what they had this is covetousness. And 
how is that idolatry? Somebody explain to me how covetousness is a form of idolatry. Jeffrey? And that you're self-serving, that you're choosing your own what is right and wrong for yourself. Okay. So anytime we prioritize our way over God's way, we are essentially demoting God and promoting self. And that's having another God beside him. Uh, self is the most frequently worshipped and most dangerous adversary of true worship of God. Okay. Verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words. Because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. There are many vain words being bandied about in our day uh, that would attempt to say you can be X, Y, or Z all of which the Bible condemns and still be right with God. Paul would call them vain empty words. Now, the wrath of God will come upon the children of disobedience. Do not be partakers with them for you were once darkness but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Okay, for the fruit of, and here we have a textual variant, King James says spirit. All your other versions are going to say light. It does appear that the evidence is stronger in favor of light than it is in spirit. But the bottom line is it doesn't make any difference because what is the fruit of the light if it's not the fruit of the spirit? <laughs> okay. Um, it's all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So these are the characteristics of people who are walking in light. They are good. And of course, goodness is inextricably tied to love. Love seeks the highest good of those. Right? Righteousness, it's in harmony with the Word of God. Truth, it's in harmony with uh, reality at the broadest, and specifically with the truth of God revealed in His Word. Proving what is acceptable. And here, then, puts the subjective element into our walk as the children of light where we must test what is pleasing to the Lord. You ought to have beside that verse, verse 9, Romans 12, 2, because it's the exact same language that shows up that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Okay. That is that you may test, examine, and uh, thereby discern. Right. Do not be partakers with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather, indeed, reprove them. So, the first half of verse 11 is uh, what has, uh, in the story told about Steve Heron, walked up to a group of preachers in a circle at Camp Meeting at Hope Sound, uh, they were talking and laughing, and uh, then one preacher said, Hey, have you heard? And began to talk about another preacher who was not there, and it was uh, gossip. And Heron turned on his heel the minute it began and walked away. And everyone knew that two things had happened. They had been... Uh, he had not participated in their unfruitful work of darkness, and he had reproved them, though he had not done so verbally. He had done so through his silent withdrawal of his presence. Okay. Uh, so my point is that there are multiple ways of reproof. All reproof does not have to be verbal. But... It does appear that in Paul's way of thinking, our, uh, our job as a Christian is not simply to stay pure and clean. We must also be a rebuke to 
ungodliness. And this is where persecution comes in. Okay? Because if you're comfortable letting them live, you live and let live, I mean, you know, we all have our thing, then your life is no rebuke to them. But if you say, that's wrong, you are condemning them. You are judging them. And they will whip out Matthew 7, 1, and try to use it as a club to beat you over the head with it. Judge not. Don't you know what's wrong with you, Christian? Haven't you read your Bible? And you should be prepared to whip out John 7, 24. Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Uh, and if you want, if they're actually interested in the conversation, <laughs> Matthew 7, by their fruits you shall know them. Beware of false prophets. A good tree doesn't bring forth bad fruit. A bad tree doesn't bring forth good fruit. Uh, my mother got in quite a bit of trouble in her job in Birmingham, Alabama, because she didn't carouse, tell dirty jokes, or approve uh, her boss's uh, profligacy, lecherism, and her boss's boss's homosexuality. And so uh, when she was leaving that lab, they picked up the phone and called every other lab that they knew in the city of Birmingham to say, if Nadine Brown applies, don't hire her. But God is greater than men, and their attempts were thwarted. It is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. When I was in first, second, third grade was when the first hints of homosexuality were coming into American culture and there were lots of jokes about someone being gay. That they, they, they were made fun of. They were laughed at. As I grew in my understanding of scripture, I recognized that God doesn't view those things as funny. He views them as shameful. And that uh, while it's true that Scripture names kinds of sins and gives stories in which people do sin, uh, there's never any uh, salacious detail. Right? Scripture has no juicy stories. Even David's adultery with Bathsheba is basically he saw her, he took her, he lay with her, and she went home. You know, no details. And uh, for that reason, I think many contemporary Christian novels uh, violate this passage. It's a shame to speak of those things that are done of them in secret. Uh, Bruce not Bruce Wilkinson, but David Wilkerson's Run Baby Run The Cross and the Switchblade tended to glorify the uh, wickedness of the gang life by its fairly explicit detail of uh, what was done by them in their wickedness. And This text tells us that we should regard such things as shameful not to be spoken of uh, at least not to be spoken of in terms of casual conversation or joking certainly not for edification or entertainment purposes perhaps only in the context of judicial or uh, the exposure and rebuke of yeah. I, I, for, so for example when when someone has fallen morally and they are repenting of that moral failure before the church, no details. You just name the sin and you move on. You don't need the details. It's not good for them or for the congregation. All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Okay. 
so here is a definition of light whatever makes manifest is light so you know, Paul's use and John's use appear to be a little bit different so that's no big deal I mean, biblical authors can use the same metaphor differently wherefore he says and then he quotes Isaiah 60 verse 1 Wake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Uh, see then that you walk circumspectly. The word circumspectly means paying attention to what's going on around you. Verse uh, 15. Akrivos uh, is uh, the word for being careful, sometimes even precise. Not as fools. And here the word is uh, asofu. Uh, but wise, uh, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Okay, so again, I would import all of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament right into this. Right here, what does it mean in Paul's mind to be wise? Well, I'm certain he has in view all that the Old Testament would have to say about that. And uh, then he makes application in terms of making good use of the time. Verse 17. Do not be unwise, aphronous, uh, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. If wisdom is seeing life and all of its components from God's perspective, keeping the proper focus, then that's another way of saying understanding God's will. All right? All right, and that brings us to Ephesians 5:18. Do not be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you've had about this text or the theological concept of being filled with the Spirit. Okay, so I'll ask you, why do Wesleyan uh, interpreters understand being filled with the Spirit to refer to something subsequent to regeneration? Okay, what about these people? Okay, this is a present imperative, and present imperatives can mean continue doing what you are already doing. They do not have to mean start doing something that you have not done yet. So, that would seem to mean that this could be read as just continue in what was already true of you at salvation. So we need something more than that. Okay, uh, so that's a, a large-scale contextual argument. I would prefer to not, as putting on my biblical theologian's hat, I would prefer to talk about Ephesians 3 as uh, prayed for them to experience the full lordship of Christ in their life rather than using the language of Thessalonians' entire sanctification. Uh, but... Uh, in Ephesians 3, it's just strengthening by the Spirit. There's no language of filling. Okay. You're filled up to the fullness of God. Is that the same thing as being filled with the Spirit? If, if so, how do we know? Okay. Uh, 
What I'd like you to connect in your mind is X19. Right? X19 and X20. In X19, Paul meets the Ephesians. First thing he asks these Ephesian believers is, have you been filled with the Spirit? Did you receive the Spirit when you believed? And uh, they say, uh, we didn't know there was a Spirit. Now let me ask you, does your knowledge of theology determine whether God does what he wants to do in you or not? In other words, if you don't know that there's a Holy Spirit, you can't be filled with the Spirit. No, that's not true. All right, we'll pick up right there and do our best to make it through chapter 6 next time. <laughs>